All right, welcome everyone. Let's see, streaming, recording, yes. All right, welcome everyone to this week's Water, Wetlands, and Watershed Seminar. This week, we are fortunate enough to have Dr. Alice Besterman with us. Um, Alice is a postdoctoral fellow with the Buzzards Bay Coalition and the Woodwell Climate Research Center, um, both in Massachusetts. And Dr. Besterman received her bachelor's uh, in environmental studies from Virginia Commonwealth University and her PhD in environmental sciences from the University of Virginia. She's from Virginia, but she broke away and now is up in the Northeast. Um, she's a coastal ecologist, studies in general sea level rise, uh, invasive species, climate change, impacts on coastal ecosystems. Um, and her PhD looks specifically at the distribution and impacts of an invasive seaweed on intertidal mudflats in Virginia. And her postdoc is focused on Northeastern tidal marsh vulnerability, which I think we'll hear about today and kind of what to do about it, which is great. So it's not just all doom and gloom. I, I'll assume there's some doom and gloom. Um, just admitting some more folks into the room. Um, and Dr. Besterman's current projects are funded by the EPA and the Southeast um, New England program, as well as the USGS through this Climate Adaptation Science Center program that has hubs all over the US, a cool, a cool program. So Alice, the floor is yours. Please go ahead and share your screen. Thanks for coming to speak with us today. All right. Let me get into... All right, so does everyone see the title slide? Looks perfect, yep. All right, great. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for having me today. I'm looking forward to talking about New England, Northeastern salt marshes with you. So, um, First, I wanted to note that this is a partner project. We have a number of key partners, including research institutions, environmental NGOs, and state and federal agencies that are helping to conduct this work. So salt marshes are globally distributed productive ecosystems. Shown here as the darker green boundary around North America, you can see that they cover much of the coastline of North America. They're characterized by dense stands of grasses and forbs and zones or mosaics of dominant species. But salt marshes are experiencing rapid loss globally. And this loss can occur in multiple modes. And one of the primary types of loss and the one that I'll be focused on today is this interior drowning loss where on the interior platform of the marsh, expanding areas of dead vegetation and shallow water are seemingly consuming the marsh from the inside out. An email that was recently sent to the Buzzards Bay Coalition, the environmental nonprofit I work with, came from a resident in the Buzzards Bay watershed asking if there was anything that could be done about the marsh they were observing dying off near their home. The email reads, the marsh grass is dying off in patches, leaving just mud that the water now flows into and is creating new smaller canals and rivulets when the tides are high. The grass die off is a recent phenomenon within the last year from what I've seen. The shoreline itself, which my property abuts has not changed or been affected yet. Though once the marsh goes, I would imagine that would soon follow. This area has brought us so much peace and joy, we are willing to do quite a lot to save it. This dieback occurring has scientists, resource managers, and of course, residents concerned. And this dieback is really important because marshes, in addition to mattering a lot to people, are critical habitat for fishes and birds and provide a number of ecosystem services to society, including coastal protection. To treat these areas of expanding shallow water, coastal managers have begun to try a technique called runnels, which is a way to very low intensive, a low intensive method to get the water off the marsh and promote revegetation. Now you might be looking at this photo and think that looks like a pan I've seen in regular marshes that seems to be naturally occurring but the extent, the function, and the context of these features indicates that these marshes are in fact changing. So the first thing I'm going to talk with you about today is how pools and pans used to function as dynamic natural features in the marsh system. However, due to sea level rise and other factors at present, they are now expanding and contributing to marsh loss. And I'll talk about what some future trajector trajectories for these pools and pans are. 
I'll talk about runnels as an emerging adaptation technique used to help salt marshes adapt to sea level rise. And I'll talk about whether runnels can help buy some time for salt marshes and be used as a component of a more holistic adaptation plan for marshes. So these unvegetated features of pans and pools are naturally occurring and contribute to this mosaic of unvegetated features in the marsh complex. Pans, like the ones shown here, are shallow forb dominated areas characterized by bare dry sediment and plants such as salicornia or glasswort. Pools are deeper depressions that remain flooded throughout the lunar tide cycle. And classically, both of these features are considered transient, popping up and revegetating with time across the marsh platform or in dynamic equilibrium with the vegetated marsh area. That is, they're not contributing to net marsh loss, but even if they move or expand, that change is being balanced out by gains in vegetation elsewhere. The classical understanding of pans is they begin with vegetated marsh that endures a disturbance, transition to a bare sediment and or and vegetated um, vegetation community change, but begin to revegetate with other marsh grasses within two to four years. Pools, on the other hand, follow a cycle over much long, longer time spans, either decades or centuries. A pool forms and expands slowly, reaching some critical width, at which point a tidal creek incision occurs, the pool drains, and that intertidal mudflat can revegetate. Here you can see an example of pool drainage and revegetation adapted from Mariotti 2016 um, in Cape May, New Jersey. Here in 1954, you can see this isolated pool, which is what IP stands for. And that isolated pool becomes connected, CP, by 1991, drains and begins to revegetate. Similarly, this isolated pool in 1991 becomes drained by a tidal creek seen here, connected, drains, and revegetates by 2015. However, these cycles appear to be changing. Bare and shallow water areas are increasing in number and size across the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Features such as these are increasing in size, frequency, and um, density in many states across New England. In the Buzzards Bay watershed, which is shown here and can be found south of Boston, bounded to the east by Cape Cod, a study of um, Historical aerial imagery between 1938 and 2009 has so far indicated that with very few exceptions, pans have deepened and enlarged and pools have expanded. Zooming in on one marsh island within that Buzzards Bay watershed, we see a 1954 image here on the left and a 2009 image here on the right. In 1954, the marsh area is shown in white and water shown in gray. And in 2009, the earth dark green color is shown in, uh, is, indicates the marsh and the water is indicated in blue. While at first glance, these two images may not appear all that different, if you focus in on the pools within these circles, you can see that the diameter of the pools have in many cases expanded by double, double or triple and isolated pools have connected into these larger amorphous megapools. These observations raise the question of whether we're entering a new paradigm for salt marshes in the Northeast especially, a pattern in which pool and pan area is no longer in dynamic equilibrium with vegetated marsh areas. And this hypothesis has been supported by a number of studies across the Northeast in the recent literature. A study of a marsh in Fire Island National Seashore, New York, found a doubling of pans and pools between 1994 and 2015. A marsh in the Plum Island Estuary, Massachusetts was found to have had a total ponded area that tripled between 1949 and 2013. 
In the Blackwater River of Maryland, up to 21% of marsh area has converted to pools between 1981 and 2010. In Narragans and in Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, a study of aerial imagery between 1972 and 2011 found that 20 out of the 36 marshes that were studied lost net marsh area to interior ponding. Observing and summarizing these changes observed across the Northeast, Adamowitz and colleagues commented in a recent paper that while a few researchers have documented traits and trajectories of natural pools, the relatively sudden appearance and geographic extent of shallow pools and other marsh changes suggests a large scale driver. There are a large number of factors that are contributing to shifting pools and pans out of dynamic equilibrium with the vegetated marsh platform. And these include direct changes made to the marsh and adjacent uplands, as well as large scale environmental drivers. The most critical factors are listed here on the right with relative sea level rise being far and away the most important factor. Other important contributors include sediment supply, direct modification of the marsh and migration space for the marsh to move. So at this point, I hope I've convinced you that the historical dynamic um, cycles that shallow water used to follow on marshes is no longer occurring. And instead, these shallow water areas are expanding and contributing to marsh loss. In a paper Mariotti wrote in 2016, he proposed a framework of three trajectories for shallow water. The pool recovery trajectory is the one I've already described, where a pool can be connected to a tidal creek, drained, and revegetate. This occurs in marshes that are in or close to an equilibrium state. Accretion rates are equal to or greater than relative sea level rise, so the elevation of the marsh is staying above sea level. However, in marshes that have lost this equilibrium state and where accretion is falling below relative sea level rise rates, there are two trajectories of shallow water expansion that contribute to net marsh loss. The drowning trajectory is essentially a biogeochemical degradation pathway where higher inundation kills the plants and leads to marsh collapse. In the pool collapse scenario, physical erosion is contributing to deepening and expanding of the pool, leading to this expanding shallow water and net marsh loss. Zooming in on the drowning scenario, this is a case of higher high tides stranding water on the marsh platform, creating flooding stress for the plants and them dying back. When those plants die, the roots below ground collapse. This figure shown here, adapted from DeLon et al. 1994, shows that live roots have lots of air space, um, lots of filled air space, whereas when those vegetation, when those plants die, the roots collapse, and with it, the marsh surface subsides. As that occurs, more water is able to be held in these pools. The vegetation at the edge of the pools begins to die back and these pools begin to expand across the marsh platform. Drowning occurs in marshes where the entire platform is not keeping pace with sea level rise. For this reason, higher high tides easily flood the entire marsh and with a, a shallower gradient between the marsh platform and sea level, much of that water becomes stranded on the marsh and starts to create these pools. We can contrast this with the pool collapse scenario driven by physical erosion. With pool collapse, a tidal creek connection to a pool occurs, but when that tidal creek is connected, it expands and deepens the pool. This is different from the pool recovery scenario where that tidal creek connection allows the pool to drain and revegetate. So what's going on here? Why would marshes in some places um, when a, a tidal creek connection occurs lead to pool collapse and in other cases pool recovery? Well, a number of field studies, modeling studies and experiments have pointed to a large number of factors that can contribute to these differences, including 
channel width, channel depth, pool width and depth, and distance of the pool from the nearby um, tidal channel that it's being connected to. But if we boil those down to a very simple set of characteristics, it seems that tidal prism is a good explanation for why one trajectory versus the other is followed. Tidal prism in this case refers to the volume of water that is moving in and out of this creek and pool each tide cycle. In the pool collapse scenario, some combination of the dimensions of the pool, the creek, and the nearby body of water lead to a large tidal prism. A large volume of water is moving in and out each tide cycle, reaching higher velocities and eroding this pool and creek. In the pool recovery scenario, we're looking at a smaller tidal prism, smaller volumes of water that have to get in and out each tide, so lower velocity currents that instead of eroding the pool, allow it to drain and revegetate. An example shown here from Shepherds et al. shows a marsh covered in pools in 1938, where those pools have expanded greatly and the creeks have expanded by 2010. But I want you to take a look at the scale bar here at the bottom. The initial size of the tidal creek or channel that's been connected to in the bottom of the 1938 photograph is about 50 meters across. And by 2010 has expanded to nearly 100 meters across. The small creek in 1938 has greatly increased in size up to almost 25 meters across. I want you to keep these dimensions in mind as we begin to talk about runnels. Runnels work in a way that does not lead to pool collapse because the tidal prism is managed. They're not connected to large bodies of water, or if they are, there are different management techniques or construction techniques that are used to avoid this erosive pool collapse scenario. So returning to our framework of three shallow water trajectories, it's important to recognize that drowning and pool collapse are both predicted for high rates of relative sea level rise. And many places beginning to show signs of degradation are not yet experiencing these high rates of sea level rise. I propose that this means we have some time before total marsh loss to take action and help to divert these marshes away from either drowning or pool collapse. The implicit hypothesis of runnels is that by creating a small, shallow, low volume drainage, shallow pools can be drained the marsh can revegetate and we can avoid a pool collapse or full drowning based collapse scenario. In other words, we can shift a drowning or pool collapse scenario toward that dynamic pool recovery trajectory. So I've at this point talked about how the dynamic pools and pans of the past have become drivers of net marsh loss by contributing to either drowning or pool collapse. At this point, I'm going to start talking about runnels as an emerging adaptation technique intended to adapt salt marshes to rising sea levels. So what is a runnel? It's a small channel that creates a tidal connection between shallow water stranded on the marsh surface and a nearby creek or ditch. It follows topographical low areas or existing flow paths. Runnels are a Goldilocks solution. They create just enough drainage to reduce the flooding stress to the plants and allow, allow revegetation, but not enough drainage to lead to either bi biogeochemical degradation or the physical erosion witnessed with pond collapse. The shallow drainage of runnels differs from both these larger creeks and also from ditches historically used in mosquito management and agriculture. In this figure adapted from Wolf 1996, you can see on the y-axis is depth in centimeters and a profile for different types of hydrologic management features. Drainage ditches that were historically used were excavated to a depth of 80 centimeters. Tidal ditches were excavated as a part of open marsh water management, a more recent technique to a depth of 60 centimeters. 
Runnels, on the other hand, which are used in some mosquito management, were excavated to only about 20 centimeters. This figure I've adapted from our project partner, Wenley Ferguson, shows the different dimensions of runnels that are used in adaptation projects. Small runnels can be as small as 15 centimeters across and 25 centimeters deep. And the largest dimensions that are typically used are up to 60 centimeters across, but still only 30 centimeters deep. This shallow drainage helps to avoid some of the pitfalls that were experienced with deeply draining ditches historically used. The deep drainage of these ditches could has historically led to peat oxidation and subsidence on the marsh platform. So consider an elevation profile of a marsh. Across this elevation gradient, um, the, there are different hydro periods and tidal inundations because of elevation. And the vegetation is adapted in each of these zones to the characteristic tidal inundation regime. A unique feature of salt marshes and all wet wetlands is because the water table is at or above the marsh surface for some period of the year oxygen in the soil is depleted. Lower rates of decomposition follow, and that means that dead plant material builds up. This contributes to peat formation and is a critical process allowing marshes to gain vertically in elevation. Deeply draining ditches lowered the water table across the entire marsh platform. And while the vegetation might have been productive in response to this, the higher oxygen levels led to much increased levels of decomposition, oxidized the peat that was present and decreased rates of peat production. As a result, peat oxidation and subsidence occur. The shallow drainage created by runnels should avoid this outcome. Runnels have Runnels are similar to mosquito control methods that have been used over the past 20 to 30 years. Wenley Ferguson, the Director for Habitat Restoration at Save the Bay, Rhode Island, began working with mosquito control agencies and adapting these methods to use in climate adaptation projects for marshes beginning around 2010. Wenley Ferguson is a project partner of ours and has contributed greatly or led much of the work I am presenting today. Since 2010, runnels for sea level rise adaptation have been tried in at least six northeastern states and 17 marsh complexes distributed across these states as shown in the gray shaded states on the right. In the majority of these projects, some revegetation was seen within two years after runnel creation. So how should we expect ecosystem responses to change with runneling? Well, we should expect an initial phase of drainage, followed by a second phase of early colonizing vegetation, and third, for higher elevation species of marsh grasses that are less tolerant to inundation to begin to move in in that final third phase. Here I'm showing the percent cover change over time for a hypothetical marsh treated with a runnel. Percent cover is shown on the y-axis and time in years is shown on the x-axis spanning a 10-year window. Initial conditions include high aquatic condition cover, so water, algae, and in some cases, even intertidal seagrass, such as rupia. Bare sediment areas are also seen covering the marsh and low vegetation is present. After a runnel is created, indicated by the red dashed line, aquatic conditions decline rapidly with drainage. Bare areas replace those, as well as forb species such as glasswort or salicornia that I mentioned before are characteristic of pans. With respect to the peat and elevation, we might expect with drainage an initial loss of elevation as the poor spaces of the soil collapse because the water has been drained out and a slight increase in oxidation. As time goes on, we should expect the bare peat areas to reach a peak level and begin to decline 
as vegetation continues to increase. Forb species should continue to increase, reaching a peak percent cover as Spartina alterniflora begins to colonize the drained area. In the final phase of marsh of the um, ecosystem response to runneling, we should expect to see Forbes drop to low levels, Spartina alterniflora increase to a point where it actually starts to decrease as our high marsh species or low tolerance to, uh, to inundation species begin to move in. At this point, the below ground roots that are being produced can compensate for the elevation that was lost and potentially even lead to net increases in elevation. Another driver of elevation accretion, depending on the system, might be the import of sediment with the runnel, actually adding mineral sediments to the marsh platform. With these hypotheses in mind, our project team launched a large scale experimental test of runnels in the Buzzards Bay watershed this past year. While runnels have been tried in restoration projects and monitored, our group experiment is proving to be the um, most intensively monitored and rigorously studied test of runnels to date. So our primary research questions include whether runnels consistently drain expanding shallow pools, if runnels drain mudflats, if drained mudflats from runnels consistently revegetate, and how drainage and revegetation patterns differ across a gradient of platform elevation and pool degradation. There are a number of sub questions beneath each of these, including how far from a runnel can we detect the effect of drainage? And how commonly do we get high marsh species moving back into these drained pool areas? We're conducting the study in two sub estuaries of the Buzzards Bay watershed, which differ significantly in environmental context and marsh characteristics that are indicated here with these red dots. We're conducting a replicated backy design experiment, which stands for before after control impact indicating the sites are monitored before and after an impact is conducted and that we are studying both reference and experimental sites. We're studying five experimental and five reference sites in each of these marshes, totaling, coming to a total of 20 sites across these estuaries. At all sites, we are surveying a number of quantitative vegetation metrics and have installed photo stations so that we can look, we can monitor changes long term with photographs. At a subset of 12 of these sites that we are calling our intensive sites, we're studying a longer list of ele environmental changes, including elevation, soil characteristics, water level, soil shear strength, water quality and total suspended solids, decomposition rate, and a number of other environmental variables. Two aerial, aerial images of the two sites we're studying are shown here. The transects indicate the monitoring transects, these lines, I'm sorry, indicate our monitoring transects for our sites. Each of these sites was set up so that an area of shallow pooling water was um, within the site and the monitoring transect was set up to bisect that pool running from the upland edge down toward the creek with the pool centered in the transect. The purple lines indicate experimental runnel sites and the reference sites indicate locations that we are not treating with runnels. Runnels were connected between the pooled areas and a nearby ditch such as those shown here. And the stars indicate our intensive sites or the ones where we're measuring that larger set of environmental variables. Monitoring of these sites before runnel construction began in summer 2020 and the runnels were created between October and November of 2020 and modifications proceeded in phases of the runnels through February 2021. Apologies for that year inaccuracy. 
2021 will prove our first opportunity to measure some of the responses to runnels and our first growing season post runnel changes. And we plan to monitor these sites through 2023 at least. We partnered with local mosquito control agency in this project. And here you can see their low ground pressure excavator initiating the work. This excavator exerts only 1.9 pound per square inch of pressure on the marsh surface. And to put that in context, the average person exerts about 16 pounds per square inch of pressure. Sorry. You can see that the excavation can remove a very thin layer of marsh soil, only a few inches. And following these little white foam bubbles, you can see drainage beginning. Runnels are constructed to be shallowest where they intersect the pool and become deeper as they move farther away. On the right, you can see the deepest dimensions we created these runnels to about 30 centimeters wide by 30 centimeters deep. We extended excavated runnels using shovels in order to create meanders and have better control over the depth and width of the runnel as it moved into the pool. We dug the um, runnel so that they came to the deepest part of the pool. And here on the right, you can see that same pool that the excavator was working on on the previous slide later that same day after we've extended the runnel using shovels. That same pool can be seen here on the left mid growing season with a large volume of impounded water. So our post runnel monitoring data is still to come. But in the meantime, we do have some monitoring data from restoration projects that we can use to understand how we should expect these runnels to affect the marsh. So the Winnipeg Marsh Project was led by Wenley Ferguson beginning in about 2012. This marsh is a grid ditched marsh you can see on the right and large volumes of water were impounded on it in 2011. These black transects indicate the monitoring tra transects where Ferguson and colleagues measured vegetation and water levels from 2011 before runnels were created through 2019. A small number of hand dug runnels were created in 2012, but the bulk of the work occurred in 2013 and 2014 using a combination of excavators and shovels. Here you can see photos from 2011 and 2013 at the Winnipeg site. On the left, you can see where impounded water has, is covering the marsh and the marsh grass is dying back. And just a year after the work has begun in 2013, excuse me, you can see where the water has drained off of the marsh and vegetation is recovering. Aerial imagery also reflects the changes at this site. In 2011, you can see these large pools are covering the entirety of the marsh. And in 2019, especially at the bottom of the photograph, which is a higher elevation area, you can see that the pools have drained and revegetation is occurring. The lower elevation area at the top of the photograph still was holding larger amounts of water even in 2019, but there was some drainage and revegetation in that area as well. The data I'm going to show you in the next slide were collected along this second tr center transect, this longest one in the middle of the um, marsh. So here are some percent cover data collected from before runnels were created and through 2019 after. On the Y -x axis is percent cover and on the X axis is the phase of the project and actual years are shown in bold across the top of the figure. Initially, this transect was characterized with a high level of Spartina alterniflora cover, but also high cover of algae and open water. After runnels were created, the aquatic conditions of algae and water decreased rapidly and were replaced by bare peat, as well as a, a rapid increase in salicornia, which is one of those pan early colonizing species. 
By 2014, Salicornia reached a peak cover and began to decline as other species moved in. Spartina alterniflora began increasing in 2014, and the aquatic conditions of algae and water remained low. Bear peat remained about the same through this second phase. In the third phase, we see Spartina alterniflora cover remaining high, bear peat beginning to decline, as well as aquatic conditions remaining low. And a high marsh, marsh species, Disticla spicata, actually beginning to colonize these bare areas and move into the marsh. So from this study, we can see that with runnel application, the water and algae can be drained from the system, vegetation can return and colonize, and high marsh species can begin to be seen on the marsh within, or begin increasing on the marsh within four years after runnel creation. From the Winnipeg study and others, a number of lessons have been learned. First, to avoid pool collapse by managing the tidal prism of a runnel pool connection. And this can be done by careful management of the runnel. Also to avoid marshes that are too far gone down the drowning trajectory. So in this zoomed in photo of Winnipeg, we see that there was a high volume of water in some of these pools and where single runnels were connected, some scour or erosion was observed. To manage that, Ferguson and colleagues began to increase the drainage density of runnels for these larger pools, essentially creating more runnels per pool so that that volume of water wasn't all flooding through any one runnel. Deep pools that um, were present on the marsh also might need to be avoided or very carefully connected with a runnel in order to avoid an erosion scenario. Similarly, in Potter's Pond, another um, study revealed lessons learned about how to avoid erosion and pool collapse. Here, these pool, very large pools were um, up to and greater than, in some cases, 100 meters across. Further, there was a high volume of unconsolidated sediment covering the base of these pools. Through the use of sills and doing the work in phases, Ferguson and colleagues were able to manage the drainage and not lose these unconsolidated sediments. A sill is essentially just a speed bump in the runnel. I'm showing here a profile of a runnel where the connection to the pool is on the left and the deepest part that links with a ditch is on the right. The sill is an area of higher elevation that's used basically as a trap for those unconsolidated sediments. Another technique is to leave a vegetated edge at the end of the runnel so that the runnel is not directly connected to a large body of water that would increase that tidal prism. The work is also conducted in phases. And this way, as that initial drainage occurs, some um, sediment loss can be trapped in the runnel, collected and redistributed. Here you can see a photo of where unconsolidated sediments were collected in a runnel from one of our Buzzards Bay experimental sites. This can be collected and reapplied to the pool instead of being lost to the open water. Another lesson learned is to avoid marshes that might be too deep or too far down that drowning trajectory. This site in Massachusetts called the Cow Yard is grid ditched and is covered in these large pools. After runnels began in 2018, some water drainage has occurred, but it hasn't been that significant, partly because the entire marsh platform is sitting at a low elevation relative to the tide range. The exact point of where is too deep or too far gone isn't established, but we do have some ideas based on these um, restoration projects of where, what it might be close to. So I've talked about, I've introduced runnels and talked about how they might be used to help marshes adapt to sea level rise in the 21st century. To wrap up, I'm going to talk about runnels as a method to buy time for salt marshes as we move um, into increasingly accelerated sea level rise rates. 
So here's our new trajectory for expanding shallow water on a marsh. Expanding shallow water can be connected to a drainage feature with a runnel. It can be drained and revegetation can be facilitated. Importantly, we can hopefully slow or halt this feedback cycle where expanding shallow water continues to grow through either drowning or pool collapse. But once we get this revegetation, then what? Well, over the short term, some of the measurements we're making can help us understand whether this marsh can actually begin to keep pace with sea level rise and persist in a close to self-maintaining state into the future. Our measurements of elevation change will tell us whether elevation is beginning to build after runnel creation and keep, help the marsh keep pace with sea level rise. Measurements of decomposition will inform whether the runnel is contributing to any peat oxidation, though we're taking steps to um, try to avoid that outcome. Rates of sedimentation or deposition of sediment on the marsh platform can tell us whether the runnel is helping to bring more sediment into the system and help it grow vertically. And measurements of bulk density and soil shear strength that we're making will inform how the soil is becoming more or less vulnerable to erosion, hopefully less vulnerable, and how the change in root structure is affecting the um, soil strength in total. But over the long term, a number of accelerating stressors are still at play for these marshes. Sea level rise, low sediment supply, small tidal ranges, and impediments to migration all still threaten these marshes. And so runnels might provide in the long term an opportunity to buy some time, but other adaptations are going to be needed in a holistic adaptation plan. Facilitating marsh migration can help to allow these marshes to move inland and upland. Runnels have been used to facilitate marsh migration by connecting them into adjacent upland areas and accelerating that process of saltwater intrusion in the nearby forest. This way, the runnel can address the hydrology in the marsh platform, but the removal of impediments such as stone walls and the creation of runnels into the upland can help that marsh move inland and persist through the next century. Sediment placement or the addition of mineral sediments directly to the marsh might help to compensate for low sediment inputs in marshes. While none of these techniques are a silver bullet on their own, runnels are an important hydrologic modification that when used correctly and in combination with other techniques might help salt marshes adapt to future sea level. And with that, I want to acknowledge the project partners that are working on this SNEP funded project with me. Um, they all have contributed greatly, as well as other collaborators on the project, students and interns that have helped, and the landowners that have been instrumental to, to site selection and access. And with that, I can take some questions. All right, thank you so much. Let's give Dr. Besterman a round of applause, either in real life or with your little Zoom reactions there. And we'll have some questions. So Alice, our first question, um, I'll do one from YouTube and then I'll come into the room. The, I have one from Christine Angelini. Dr. Angelini asks, is there a relationship between the prevalence of ponds and um, historic ditching in these marshes? So in other words, are they more common in ditched versus unditched marshes? There is some indication, we know that they're common in ditched marshes. But that Potter's Pond project I showed with those really giant mega pools actually has very little ditching at all. So there does seem to be a relationship. Historic ditching probably contributes to these. We know that where at the head of the ditch, these things can form, especially where ditches have been plugged either naturally or intentionally so that water's not moving through them well anymore. We do see pool formation in those areas. But there are pools forming in unditched marshes. Um, and the assumption is that that is just based on the marsh not keeping pace with sea level rise and increasing rates of sea level rise affecting it. Great, thanks. It looks like that was Dr. Kathy Ewell's question as well. So instead, I think we'll go to, was it um, Gabby? Did you have a question for Anastasia? 
Here we go. So Anastasia, I don't think she has a mic. So she asked, um, well, I'm not going to say it's a very nice compliment. She loves your presentation. Um, have you noticed the increase or decrease in species along with this other trajectory of sort of ecological change? Um, and how does that sort of like exacerbate the interference with the, or this, this process? Um, and also how will the runnels respond to major storms and our hurricanes, things like nor'easters in your neck of the woods? So the first question in terms of species, is that question directed toward like effects on wildlife or how vegetation species are being changed? We'll let Anastasia type in her answer while you while you answer the second one about uh, storms and stuff. So okay, so um, it is tough to manage the effect of storms in this area, and the best techniques that have been found so far are just time of year. So by doing the work um, in the later winter or very early spring, it's possible to let the marsh begin to revegetate in the growing season without those nor'easters occurring. So when we did the work last fall, that was kind of the a less ideal time um, because then they had to experience the entire winter of storms. But based on our observations, we haven't seen any damage because the runnels are created to um, move they're created to come around the high marsh. They're created in a sinuous way. And so we try to avoid there being this direct linear path of fast moving water with waves and wind that could affect the pools itself. So we try to manage it based on location and timing. It's a long answer. Okay. Well, I'll say that one of your YouTube viewers is Wenley Ferguson and he answered um, that the Potter's Pond site didn't have ditches but had some agricultural embankments that impounded some water on the marsh. So this is cool, we're getting-, um, getting Thanks, Wenley. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, so uh, Kathy, Dr. Yule, you do have another question. And you're muted, so you gotta unmute. There you go. I, I enjoyed your presentation a lot. I remember teaching about open marsh management a few decades ago, and I wonder if, if that really has, was a big mistake, uh, or it sounds like you were very nice to say that that kind of masked your, that was your, uh, guided your approach to it, but uh, should that just not have been done? I can say that I know in the Northeast, a lot of open marsh water management is being undone. So ditch plugs that were put in to create those pools and radial effects are being, the plugs are being removed, the pools are being uh, tried to fill in and basically undo that. So I, I don't want to. I don't want to say that it's a giant mistake. I'm not sure I have the expertise to make a statement like that. But I do know that there are certainly negative effects being observed here in the Northeast, and actions are being taken to try and reverse those um, activities. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, we do have one more from YouTube. Well, it's actually from Christine again. So she wants to know: Are you seeing signs of Sisarma, so this uh, marsh crab burrowing along the margins of your runnels? And so maybe this can also connect back to Anastasia's question, just about: Are there either facilitative or degrading sort of biological interactions that you're observing or might expect? Interactions with crabs is an open question and a really important one. That's a it's a really hot topic with everyone who talks about this approach up here, both the burrows created by fiddlers and, you know, we don't historically think of fiddlers as damaging the marsh, but without vegetation and where we have these really extensive burrow networks, it's, it's, it's really dramatic, at least the way it looks. So Sarma are present in some of the marshes, but again, I think these are open questions. Um, highly controlled research on runnels is pretty new. And so looking at those crab interactions is really important and not well known right now. I know it's something that, uh, that Christine and our colleague, uh, Andrew Altieri would both be interested in, in working on with you, hopefully someday. So Mark, you have a question. Yeah, it was actually gonna be about crabs and any sort of synergistic effect that you see. And I was wondering if in your monitoring efforts, do you actually keep track of crab burrows or you know, is there some critical point at which your drainage allows for the crabs to get in, which reinforces drainage and you all of a sudden get a, a ramping up of that interaction? But it sounds like that's still a question that's outstanding based on your previous answer. But um, 
Yeah, excellent presentation, by the way. That was really well delivered and, and spot on. Very good. Oh, thanks. If if Wenli is still on, she, so in her experience, she has seen um, cases where it seems like crabs sort of moved up the runnel and into mm -hmm. the dieback area. Um, so, so we do have some observational evidence of that starting to occur. Great, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so it seems like, you know, um, you, I had a question just if, you know, if you can't drain one uh, well enough with a shallow runnel, can you just do multiple? And it's sort of this, the bigger question I had in mind is, you know, each one of these has a different aspect, there's different fetch, as soil, shear strength, all these things. And so I'm just wondering if there's, along with all these observations, have you looked at some approaches like the Mariotti, the modeling, hydrodynamic, Delft 3D type modeling to say, you know, there's three ways we might restore this one. Two are more likely to succeed or, you know, or to fail based on projected wins and, you know, run up and all that kind of stuff. I have not um, done that. I would, that would be fantastic. And I would love a collaborator that would be interested in running a Delft 3D uh, model to think about how to construct a runnel. That would be awesome. Thank and you. I think it could be really helpful um, and start to help us think about how to do this right now. It's done by walking the marsh, making small changes, seeing how hydrology responds and working incrementally in an uh, adaptive fashion. Great, thank, thank you so much, um, Alice, for the great presentation. One more round of applause for everyone, from everyone, if you can, um, while I pull up next week's seminar. So next week we will have with us, I think we have two more for the semester, Next week, we have Dr. Samantha Chapman from Villanova talking about warming and mangrove encroachment. So another intertidal coastal ecosystem interacting with climate change, you know, changing the look and structure and function of our coastal landscape. So hope you'll join us for that. Um, and until then, have a great week. Everyone be well. And thanks again, Alice. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks. Bye.